audience? I wonder if you're thinking, why is somebody reviewing the new guy 20 years after it released? Well, in high school, it was a comedy movie I adored. All the PG-13 sexuality, lots of music, lots of cameos, but after yet another recent rewatch, I admit it ain't that good, so there I said it! <laughs> Let's go back two decades and discuss the highs and lows of this movie's own particular style. The new guy, released by Columbia Pictures from Revolution Studios, stars DJ Qualls, Eliza Dushku, and Eddie Griffin. It tells the zero to hero story of high schooler Dizzy Harrison. Just a blip on the radar screen, and only his fellow funky bandmates as friends, Dizzy lands in jail after an over-medicated freakout from the embarrassment and shame of breaking his dick in front of the whole school. There he meets Luther, played by Griffin, who sympathizes with Dizzy and shows him how he was able to start fresh in a new prison. After learning to walk the walk and talk the talk, Who's the Fiat now? and let's not forget the highly important crazy eyes, Dizzy, with a new look, enrolls as Gil Harris at a rival school, where he immediately makes his mark as a bad boy, picking a fight with a stereotypical 90s to 2000s douchebag. Dude, shut up! Douchebag's girlfriend, Douche Koo, Danielle, invites Gil to a football game hoping to drum up some much needed school spirit. From here, things begin to really heat up. Can Dizzy win the heart of the girl and keep his true friends all while living a lie? Or, much like his dick, will this charade break in front of everyone? Find out by watching The New Guy. You've probably already seen this movie, but just so nobody goes rodeo on my ass and saying I spoiled it. Spoilers <laughs> in the house. I wasn't able to find out much about the production of this movie, but I like to imagine at some point this exact conversation happened. We got a problem. We got a movie release date. It's coming up in a month or so, and it has been the most god-awful experience for everyone involved. Right, coach? I mean, yeah. Do you have any ideas how we might turn this thing around? Good music? Music? Hey. <laughs> this is one of the most music-infused films I've ever seen, whether it be from the unrelenting soundtrack, the comedic cues, <laughs> this babe's got it all. or the characters in it themselves playing music. This movie finds a way to rarely go 30 seconds without playing music to fill the void. I'm a new YouTuber, so I'm learning how much music you can put into a video without getting copyright claimed, and I put together this medley that I feel is safe and responsible. <laughs> Moving on. And emphasizing the previous point, there are tons of musicians who make cameos. La Lovett plays Dizzy's goofy father. Vanilla Ice appears, seemingly unable to stop, collaborate, and listen to anyone. Come on, man, I'm sick of this! And he's wearing a black label t-shirt, which reminds me that professional skateboarders Tony Hawk and Mike Vallely make appearances as well. Gene Simmons, who is famous for being in Kiss, and Tommy Lee, who is famous for being in Pamela Anderson. I mean Motley Crue. And they even got Sugar Ray to play her boyfriend. That's not Sugar Ray. No, silly goose. Not even like a son or a nephew, a sweet baby Ray. Man, that shatters my entire universe. Dude, do you ever shut up? And while there are plenty more cameos, the one I get most pumped for is Henry motherfucking Rollins. You play my kind of music. Even though I have it on good authority that he is a liar. I'm a liar! Yeah, I'm a liar! But seriously, if you never have, check out some of his writings and poetry. He's a real dude that I've grown fond of over the years, and I'm happy to send folks down that rabbit hole. You're sure to find some of the substance this film is lacking. Ooh. Hey, hey, hey. Denial is not just a river in Egypt! So let me qualify that with one example that embodies my overall issue. So in one scene, his friend says, No, look, my dad loves his bike more than he loves me. That's not true. No, it is. He wrote it in my birthday card. But later on, he has no reaction whatsoever to the motorcycle being crashed into the back of the car. As a matter of fact, they all bob their heads along to music while apparently forgetting that they'd be dragging the motorcycle behind them. This could have worked as a comedic beat on its own, highlighting the oblivious nature of the teenagers while demonstrating self-awareness. 
But this begs the question, did nobody in production notice this? Or did someone notice and they said, well, who cares? It was just a joke. It doesn't really matter. But what does really matter in all creative endeavors, and for really being honest with ourselves, life as a whole, is Sweet Baby Ray's barbecue sauce. Why are you paying child support for your dumbass kids when you could be consuming more Sweet Baby Ray's barbecue sauce? You'll be flying high because the sauce is the boss. Quit it. Okay, I admittedly went off the rails there. Where was I? Oh yeah, dragging the motorcycle. If nobody noticed, then that's a reflection of a general incompetence, but I do think it was the latter. And that attitude is pervasive and does matter, despite this being a silly comedy movie, because it aims to have a heart. Or at least appear like it does. Before I leave this scene, I just want to say I watched the director's cut expecting to find a deleted scene that indicates his dad was actually the coach because of these matching jokes. My dad loves his bike more than he loves me. I love you more than my own good for nothing son. I think it could have worked really well here to show him looking out the window of the house and saying, that's my damn motorcycle. Even a cutaway to a photo in post-production could have given these characters a connection. And then all you need is a simple thumbs up to his son from the crowd at the homecoming dance. And you could have given both of these characters the semblance of a character arc. I will re-emphasize that it's 100% okay to like this movie. I did. I was absolutely the target audience. And as a 13 year old with them hormones kicking in, I must admit I took to Eliza Dushku the way that Homer Simpson took to donuts. Mmm. Dushku. She is ravishing. He regularly commented on my ravishing beauty, following up with audible uh, groans, ooing and awing. Dushku mm, says the bull showrunner, Glenn Gordon Karen, knees, even banker. defending the weatherly remarks, adding, What does Eliza mm, expect? She, she was, was in Maxim. Sorry about that. I've been editing a long time. And with comedies, for most people, if you're entertained, then it succeeded. I want fans of any movie I critique to know that you're respected and welcome here in my kingdom. I'm assessing a film, not the people who watch them. We're surrounding you with love. Love what you love and don't let me or anyone else take it from you. I'm only pointing out how even small adjustments, a few shots, or even a single line added here and there could have boosted this film's integrity above the abysmal 7% critic score on Rotten Tomatoes. Danielle's arc with Emily is so paper thin that I honestly thought that Emily was judging her over her taste in music and that was the real riff in the friendship. Uh, hey, do you play Creed CD? Oh my god, can your music taste get any lower? Yeah, I'll check for you. And Danielle, secretly longing for friendship, thinks... Later on, Danielle apologizes and Emily accepts. We're long, right thinking, I'll forgive her for a bad music taste because that's my sacrifice. If you think I glossed over that, I didn't. Those are the only two times Emily speaks. I know. It's a perfect case study of why you show and don't tell. Emily appears, Danielle tells Dizzy and the audience how she dropped her as a friend, and 10 minutes later in the movie, they've made up and it feels shallow. If this had been shown to us earlier, maybe instead of introducing Danielle by having her wiggle with her friends and say aloud that her boyfriend is dreamy, I have a dreamy boyfriend. you could have shown Emily wave at Danielle and see Danielle hesitate to wave back, and her boyfriend come put his arm around her and pull her away from the interaction with Danielle looking guilty and torn about it. This could have introduced Danielle as an actual character, give insight into why she unnaturally hates her own boyfriend, and made this payoff more satisfying. And I could have avoided all of that Creed confusion. And fun fact, Creed were the only musicians on the entirety of planet Earth who didn't participate in this film. We'll not be here tonight. Pete will not be here tonight. Where are they? That's a fact. Why? These things really happened. <laughs> no, they didn't. No, 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 they didn't. But you can imagine what it'd be like if they did, right? Huh? Zoe Deschanel was so inspired by this movie that she started her own show called The New Girl in its honor. You inspires me. That's a fact! Cobra Kai was so inspired by this and its anti-bullying message that they named a character Hawk in its honor. Hawk. 
That's a fact! The way they present the information that Dizzy and Gil are the same person is actually pretty hilarious considering that DJ Qualls is a goddamn lizard person. Excuse me, but we discourage name calling around here. Guess what, folks? Gil and Diz are the same guy. He made fools of all of you. It's the same thing as if you had one friend who was a velociraptor, but suddenly he changed his hair and enrolled at a new school, and all of a sudden nobody knows who he is or recognizes him. They're all like, Bro. Alan. Yes, that's him, the velociraptor over there. And this is the emotional climax of the movie. Danielle, front and center, dancing at a homecoming dance that's happening after the state championship game somehow. While conveniently not noticing the people on the stage are the same ones Dizzy claimed he didn't know earlier. Gil, do you know these people? Good thing he didn't act weird about it. A lie he told for no reason whatsoever except to artificially create drama in the script. Not the type would drop your friends. So after getting it explained to her like a kindergartner, Danielle walks away for 30 seconds, then forgives Dizzy with no consequences for lying, much like his friends did earlier, and much like Emily did for her, while the bad guys suffer the consequences for telling the truth and participating in investigative journalism. Combine that with the non-stop music, jokes, young women wiggling, cameos, and movie references, the all-style, no-substance approach really was ahead of its time. I hope I don't come off like I dislike this movie because I don't. It's a good flick to turn your brain off to. I'm just not ready to turn in my objectivity card on the very first movie review to say that it holds up under scrutiny. And I get frustrated at how simple it could have been to improve the script because I have a soft spot for it. And I think style and substance can go hand in hand. For example, I'm absolutely going to allow myself to sexualize Eliza Dushku from a movie that marketed her sexually to me as a teenager. Baker say, who's your daddy? But I also hope the juxtaposition of bringing attention to her sexual harassment lawsuit implies that sort of behavior could have consequences. And even if there weren't consequences, hot ass bitches deserve basic respect too. While respecting her as a woman. Maybe that's why the new guy doesn't work for me anymore. I want a bit of substance to go with the style. Hmm. I guess this is growing up. Scratch that, didn't quite stick the landing there. What I meant to say was, I guess I'm not just a kid anymore.